Anyways, so um, so today we're going to be coming together to talk about cooperative governance, common pitfalls, and um, prevention slash remedy strategies. Um, as kind of a larger context, um, we're hoping to create one or more peer learning cohorts uh, focused around common governance challenges uh, that are faced by cooperatives in our network. And this is sort of a kickoff of sorts um, that we're hoping will set the foundation for that work together. So, you know, more information will come on that later. Um, the presentation today will be by Emma Rubin, who's our interim director of ICA's child care program. Um, a lot of correlation and, and overlap between child care and home care, while very different industries, um, a lot of similarities there. And Emma's work has primarily focused on um, cooperative conversion clients, but again, so much overlap there. And so I'm really confident that everything she shares today will be, be relevant. Um, to you all, whether you're just getting started out or, you know, have been around for many years. Um, we're going to hear the presentation and then break out into smaller discussion groups. If at that point you can go on your video, um, that would be really great. It's really nice to see other people's faces when we're talking. Um, there will be some question prompts uh, for those small group discussions to just kind of get the conversation going. We'll discuss for probably 10 to 15 minutes depending on where we're at timing wise. And then we're gonna come back together as a group um, and Emma will present on a new board health checkup tool um, that we would love for um, our cooperatives to try um, as both a way to you know, check up on the health of your, your board, but also as a way to really identify and report back on common challenges that we can provide some um, group education around. Um, Definitely, as always, would strongly encourage people to chime in with questions or to share real live experiences um, uh, and stories with, with the group if you feel comfortable. Also, you know, you can feel free to chime in um, through the video and audio or to use the chat function. Um, and, you know, just always welcome hearing from everyone and having as much of a lively discussion as is possible on a Zoom platform. So I will turn it over to Emma now. And yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks so much, Katrina. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you all today. Um, I'm going to share my screen, um, but when I do that, I won't be able to see the chat. So if there are uh, chats that should be interjected into the, you know, our discussion, um, maybe Katrina, you can help me, help me with that so that I can respond to them. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Um, so this presentation today really developed um, from experiences working with co-ops that are brand new, um, that are conversions clients moving from conventional ownership to cooperative ownership, and um, who wanted some support on how to keep their co-op healthy long-term but it's also informed by experiences with co-ops and other organizations that are well-established and noticing certain patterns of how co-ops can get stuck over time as they move further away from their founding. Um, so I'm excited to share, um, but also to have a lot of time and space for you to discuss your experiences today. I hope that some of this is resonant and you can take some useful observations and concrete tips away from me with this presentation, but also, you know, every co-op is different. Some of this might, material might, might not feel immediately relevant to you. So I encourage you to take what's useful and leave the rest. Um, so I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be working with this metaphor of a house <laughs> that when you first start out as a co-op, the original members often put in a tremendous amount of time setting up the governance structure. And they really think through the development of the initial policies, the reasons for setting up um, the board and other um, structures the way that they did. They sort of are the um, architects, the builders of the co-op house. But hopefully um, cooperatives last for many decades beyond the original members' involvement. And you know, some founders might stay, others will leave, new members will join. And as the co-op grows, um, 
certain things might become routine, even unquestioned. And my encouragement today is really to look at your co-op's governance system and culture around governance as something that needs attention and revisiting over time. Like a house, um, after it's originally constructed, you might need some minor repairs here and there, some maintenance, maybe even you need a fuller remodeling at some point. But you need to attend to it so it doesn't fall into disrepair. And you know, going with this analogy, if you don't do some annual upkeep, you might find that problems that start out small end up getting bigger and more difficult to repair over time. So I'm going to start by talking through some ways that co-ops can get stuck or bogged down. And um, you, know, you might see uh, some things you notice in these examples. Um, the first one, is that co-op membership and or board work feels like a drag because systems are too complicated or decisions take too long to make and implement. And one of the ways that, you know, co-ops can get bogged down in this way is that there's not a lot of interest from potential members because they look at the co-op governance, how, how it's practiced, and it doesn't look like something that they would like to get more involved with. with. Um, Governance is costly in terms of time and energy, but it doesn't feel alive, participatory, exciting, and worth it. And, you know, governance isn't always exciting, but it should be meaningful, right? Part of the beauty of having a co-op is that workers get a say in the decisions at their workplace. And it does take a lot of work, but the work should be worth it. So, you know, there are different ways to, to address this issue depending on exactly where things are breaking down. It might mean looking at your decision-making systems and thinking about how to make them more efficient, making sure the right groups are, of people are tackling the right kinds of questions, um, simplifying processes where you can. Um, it might also mean looking at your facilitation of meetings and processes and thinking about how to make significant decision-making more truly participatory and meaningful. Or it might mean looking at your communication with membership and addressing some of the ways that governance is perceived at your co-op that might not even be totally accurate. But how can your board share more of the information that members want to know, share out what is, you know, the meaningful decisions that are happening in a way that's engaging and accessible. So the second pitfall is a super common one. Um, which is that after the startup period, the co-op stops investing in training, co-op culture withers, and co-op processes aren't well understood by subsequent generations of co-op members. At the beginning, everyone's involved in the work of government, governance and has a really strong understanding of what the co-op is and what governance systems are in place. But then as new people join, as founders step out, those new members don't have that felt sense that the creators had. And they might not even understand the basics of how co-op governance is supposed to work. And, you know, that makes a lot of sense because most of us in the US don't have a lot of experience with co-ops. Um, new members might not have any prior experience with co-ops and we're getting all of our information from this experience at our workplace. Um, I actually live in cooperative housing in a limited equity cooperative, and it's 25 years old. About a third of the people who live here were founders and the other two thirds um, joined later on. Um, the founders were <coughs> an intensive process to start the co-op, but the people who joined later didn't have that experience. Most of them had not heard of co-ops before. And they re relate to the building a lot like renters. Um, we don't talk enough about what it means to be co-owners of the co-op rather than oh. like condo owners or renters. Yep. And we don't celebrate enough the difference that it makes for us or could make for us. Um, and so I think about that when I think about this pitfall and how it's up to the co-op to create opportunities for its new members to learn, its longer standing members to grow, to connect with other co-ops across the country. At a basic level, it's having robust orientations and trainings for new members and new board members. And it's also about making sure that trainings talk about the why of co-ops 
And coming back to that why, um, being intentional about how the co-op values are lived out in our day-to-day -day work and experience. Um, and it's also about you know, bringing new people into leadership, which is something I'll talk about more soon. So the next pitfall is that co-op leadership gets too concentrated in a few people with a disengaged majority and or barriers to new people stepping into leadership roles. People who hold leadership get burnt out or there are problems with those people not being accountable. And I think this is a super common issue in any organization. People who stick around become leaders. They have so much institutional knowledge and experience, but co-ops have to find ways to transition leadership. Otherwise you get too much knowledge and also power concentrated in one or more individuals. And for those people, no matter how fantastic and wonderful they are, they are humans and they can get burned out and that burnout creates problems for them as individuals. And if others don't step up to leadership roles, it creates sustainability issues for the co-op. And you know, co-ops also rely on checks and balances in their governance systems to ensure accountability. And that really requires leadership from different directions and different individuals. And there are so many reasons why new people don't step up into leadership. Sometimes there's not room for them to step up. It's I think really common to have this tension between what is said and what's real. Um, you know, it's like, run for the board, everybody, and then nobody steps up. And it's like, well, is what was there support, encouragement, intention about bringing new people in? Or was there this stated goal without really backing that up? Um, so even is there resistance among founders or longer standing members to having new people involved? These are real issues, but there are ways to address these challenges, and we can talk more about some of those ways. And then, you know, a final pitfall is that a conflict or a big crisis rocks the co-op and it's not able to recover. If we return to our house analogy, um, if you're not engaging in that regular upkeep, and even if you have some you know, governance or cultural issues that are in need of major repair that you've been putting off and a big storm comes, you're going to see some damage to your co-op house and it's going to be more serious than if you'd been attending to repairs along the way. Um, the metaphorical storm could be a financial one. It could be a crisis like COVID. It could be the loss of a leader or a serious conflict. And the more practice you have in addressing small issues as they come up, working through conflict, solving problems in a participatory way, the more equipped you'll be to deal with the big stuff when it inevitably comes. So what can we do to prevent or address some of these pitfalls? I think the first is to make a review of your governance system and the health of your cooperative culture something you do in a regular way, and to make changes, little changes to things that aren't working. And later, um, after we do breakouts, I'll present a tool that you can use to do this, um, what we're calling an annual cooperative health checkup. It's kind of an informal inspection that you can do to look around your co-op house and identify where you might need some repairs. I think just revisiting um, these questions of how we're doing with governance and our co-op culture, um, just raising the questions regularly can help make addressing issues something that's more, more natural. Um, the other thing, tip number two, is to invest in co-op education, if you can, to build cooperative training into your budget and work plans. And when I say cooperative training, I mean training that increases your capacity to operate effectively as a co-op, rather than like people's job trainings to do their job tasks. Um, so, of course, it's training to make sure new members understand your governance system and that new board members are prepared for their role. But it could also be training in meeting facilitation, in conflict resolution, in democratic management. It also doesn't have to be formal. It could be choosing an article every month to discuss over lunch. It could be um, one of your members doing some research or having a conversation with another co-op about some aspect 
of their governance and then presenting it back to staff. Um, but you know, to do it regularly in an engaging way is important. Tip number three is to proactively cultivate new leadership. And that's easier said than done. There's a lot packed in there. Um, you know, like I said, at a minimum, you'll want a way to orient new members, maybe an info session for people who are interested in running for a board seat, but aren't sure that they're going to do that. Um, training for new board directors. You might think about using buddy systems to offer informal support to new members and board members and to make sure that folks have someone to turn to with questions and for support. Um, but to get to the proactive part of this tip, leadership development is of course more than just asking, you know, who wants to run and then being surprised when, when you don't have yeses there. It's, you know, talking with members about why you think they'd be a valuable addition to the board, um, telling them what it's like and really creating on-ramps for people. Um, Beginning with making sure they know what the board does. Um, can they attend meetings and observe? Can they participate as a member in a board committee? You know, how do they even know what it is the board's doing and how do they see themselves um, as, a, as a potential board member? Sometimes it takes some, some encouragement and telling people why you think that they in particular would be a good fit. Next, connecting with other co-ops. And you're here in this Zoom, so you probably already know that there's so much to be gained from connecting with other co-ops about their experiences. Creating opportunities for wider exposure to the co-op world can also be a great opportunity for leadership development. So, you know, thinking expansively about member participation in the annual home care conference is a great thing to do in other co-op conferences. Um, who can you send that will help with nurturing your next generation of leaders? Are there ways you can connect directly with worker-owned businesses in your area and your sector? And finally, you know, if you can send folks to local and regional cooperative gatherings, it can be wonderful to connect even beyond the worker cooperative world to, you know, housing cooperatives, food co-ops, credit unions, to people who are engaged in building the solidarity and economy, um, you know, Experimenting with practices like time banking, community land trusts, participatory budgeting. Um, it's important to get that fresh perspective and connection to the why behind our work and to create networks of support. No matter what you're dealing with, I guarantee that another cooperative has had the same issue that they've dealt with. And finally, and this is really the the bottom line for this presentation, don't wait for a crisis to attend to your cooperative culture and governance system. Strong relationships, um, strong governance systems, strong culture will help you weather crisis better. This includes addressing problematic dynamics head on rather than avoiding them and letting them fester. And addressing those small issues gives your group practice and makes you more resilient for when bigger crises, crises come along. So these are some of the questions I have for you. Um, we, can, we can have a, an open format sort of discussion in Q&A if we want to, or we can go right into breakout sessions. I think I'll defer to, to Katrina on that. But the questions are, um, what resonated with you from what you just heard? What steps do you think your cooperative could put in place right away to build and attend to, take care of, your cooperative culture? And what steps would you like to see your cooperative put into place over time? Maybe you can't do them right away, but you'd like to see it in the future to build and to take care of your co-op culture. So those are the questions for our breakout. I'm gonna stop my share. Thank you so much, Emma. Welcome back everyone. I know we could have kept talking for a long time. <laughs> so it was lovely to be able to connect in our group. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, I'm curious if people want to share any highlights from their discussion um, in their group. We sort of picked up on an interesting topic at the end about paying board members. 
and um, sort of the impact of that um, positive was everything sort of we were talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, I thought that was a really interesting discussion to be having. So maybe that's a thread and somebody else would want to pick up here, but also if there's anything people want to share from their group. Well, I think the discussion we had in small group was interesting with Kippy talking about her board uh, being paid by the hour for the work that they do. And at first I thought, you know, we in this business because it's heart based. And then I think there is something about. Oh, I'm saying a lot. Sorry. There is something about taking people who function from the heart for granted and not helping them practically, expecting people to be passionate enough that they want to donate all the time. And I think what KP implemented says, yeah, we can, we can be passionate and be rewarded for it. And the more I hear about it, the more I really like it. I really like it. Well, I'll throw in my 10 cents. This is Gail Cohn. I'm the Age Friendly DC Coordinator. And what I would say is you're keeping someone from doing the job that makes them money if they are working on the board. So working on the board in a co-op makes perfect sense to me to be paid because it's the only way you can incentivize someone who's doing this very, very low, in, low remunerative job to actually want to spend time other than taking yeah. a second shift with somebody else to, to do what, what's got to be going on in their, uh -huh. their lives in order to make enough money to feed the family. So yeah. it's, it's just a silly thing to think that board members are going to be those who are working and trying to make a living, even though they're making a couple bucks more than they were when they weren't in the co-op. Agreed. Yeah, are there other co-ops on the on the call today that are paying board members that might be comfortable chiming in, sharing their experience? Can't see everyone's faces, so <laughs> I'm following you. I I believe that Capital Home Care um, we don't pay board members by the hour, but we do offer them a stipend. Um, to kind of offset some of their their time and we just started doing that recently but it seems to be going fine I can speak to that I'm one of the ones receiving the stipend it's a very nominal stipend um, but it might at least uh, cover the hours that we spend in a board meeting each month um, and a few other small meetings that we have. Um, but I would agree with the other people, especially Gail, that it is, it is not enough to cover the hours that we, <clears throat> that we put in. And uh, so we're, you know, we'll look at that over the years and, and see if we can implement payment for it, so. becomes a cost and it's an expense to the co-op that has to be shared and that means you don't make as much. And that that's a problem that has to be confronted in some way or another. That's the downside of paying board members. When you say that you don't make as much, do you mean the cooperative doesn't make as much or that the individual workers don't make as much? If they're in the co-op, their their funds are, are the, what they're paid is based on the their fair share within the co-op. And, and the co-op expenses have to be divided up, paid first, before in order to keep it viable, in order to keep the business rolling. You can't just think it is a good idea and not pay it out of the, the pool of funds that you have as revenue from having worked. Yeah, it's got to be paid for somehow. 
I think that's that's the tension, right? <laughs> that's the tension to figure out. You have to make the business side of it work. Well, I want to move off of this topic because I know you know it's just one aspect. Um, maybe just one. I'll give one last uh, opening to any other kind of key takeaways from the group discussions, and then I'll turn it back over to Emma to go over the health checkup. So, any other burning thoughts from the group discussions that anyone wants to share here? All right. Well, I'll turn it back over to Emma. Emma's going to just introduce everyone to the health checkup document. And we would love for your co ops to try this out um, and see, you know, see, does, is it helpful? Um, and as I had mentioned at the beginning, you know, we really are hoping to build out some learning cohorts, peer cohort, cohorts, the hard combination to say, <laughs> on uh, governance challenges, common governance challenges. So, you know, whether you choose to use the health checkup tool or, um, you know, otherwise think about key challenges and we'll, we'll figure out the best way to kind of come back together and communicate those. But um, definitely would love for people to give this a try if it feels like the right tool to you. So back to Emma. Thanks, Katrina. I'm going to share my screen again. Hopefully it will be large enough for you to see a little bit. Um, so this is going um, with the idea of sort of tip number one of revisiting your governance system in a regular way, how is it working in practice? And so um, really, it's just an encouragement to ask yourself some questions, um, your board questions, um, your membership, if it's feasible, um, to, to, um, to get a sense of where things might, where there might be to sort of switch to a different metaphor, sort of a, of a medical metaphor. It's a, uh, what are some symptoms or aches and pains you might be having that you might want to address, right? Um, so it's really meant as a way to open up discussion. Um, so it's, it's structured as a set of questions. There's some ideas for how to use it at the top. Um, looking at your sort of meeting culture, are, are meetings actually happening that are supposed to be happening? Are committees meeting that are supposed to be meeting? Um, do people show up to meetings? Uh, do you have a lot of absences? Is that an issue? Um, do your meetings always feel like there's too much to discuss and you never get to the end? Um, you know, who speaks at meetings? Is it one or two people? Is it more shared? Um, these are sort of some examples of the questions. Who creates the agendas? Is there a way for people to add to the agendas? Um, how's work distributed? you have a really long list of sort of bike rack questions that just grows and grows and never um, shrinks. <laughs> if we go to the membership section, um, have people who are, who are membership eligible chosen to become members? And if not, do you know why not? Are you having those follow-up conversations? Do you have a sense if, if people are opting out of membership what's going on that's not making membership appealing. Um, are member meetings, when you have them, do they feel substantive or are they more checking a box? Um, so there's a set of questions about membership. And there are some questions for the board to ask itself too. Um, have you reviewed the CEO, general manager, executive leadership in the last year? Do you even have a, a process for doing that? Um, or does that, is that something that needs to be created in order to be implemented? Um, some more questions, questions about your annual budgeting process, if, if that is happening smoothly. Um, are you looking at financial statements together? Um, does your whole board have enough financial training to be able to spot um, trends, errors, areas of concern, ask critical questions? You know, just having the financial statements isn't enough to be able to um, really critically engage with them. So this is basically an invitation to sort of walk through these questions, um, flag where you're answering, um, you know, no or not yet, um, or we didn't do this this year and we've kind of fallen out of the practice or yeah, we have been noticing um, these things. 
the idea is to do it regularly so that you can address address issues early on. And you know, you might also go through this and and decide that you know your governance system, your your cooperative culture needs some work, and you know you want to um, dedicate dedicate some time and attention to that. So it can also you know flag that for for your group. Um, so we will share that out and invite you to, to use it, to try it on, to see if it um, generates some good thoughts and discussions um, among your board. So again, thanks so much for having me. I wish I could have been in every breakout room to hear <laughs> all of your thoughts and how this landed for you. Um, definitely um, open to continuing the conversation. Um, if anyone would like to do that offline, I can share my contact information. Thanks again. Thanks, Emma. Are you sending that document, Emma? Okay. Perfect. Yes, we'll send that out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Emma. And just as a reminder, all of the recorded sessions are up on the CDF website under the Home Care Initiative Resources um, tab. There you can find all of the uh, past webinars, the recordings of past webinars, as well as the home care conference sessions. Um, there's a series of tools and we're always updating that. CDF is always updating that and putting new information there. So we will email around both um, a PDF of this PowerPoint um, from today, the presentation. Um, you can find the recording on CDF's website and then we'll send around the tool as well. And we'll be following up as well on um, next steps to gather feedback on areas where there's common challenges and common need around training so we can figure out um, some groupings and, and some, some topics to bring everybody back together. Bike rack versus parking lot. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much for participating. Really appreciate you taking this time. I know it's very valuable and we'll look forward to seeing you all in a couple of months. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.